Paul Krugman is here. He is professor of economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. His new book is called The Return of Depression Economics. I am pleased to have him on the program. His voice is frequently one that is listened to in the councils of uh, government and elsewhere as people consider what is happening in the global economics of this planet. Welcome to the broadcast. Great to be here. Uh, tell me, we were talking earlier about Japan and I have watched as Robert Rubin, right before he left as Secretary of the Treasury, uh, I've listened to George Soros and others who have huge investments or have had uh, around the world say that the Asian economic crisis is over. We have seen the worst. Uh, I realize that in Japan, uh, they're still going through uh, a very, very difficult time. So and what in China. China. And in China. Uh, so what so the Paul? two biggest Asian countries are still in, in deep sushi. No, I mean, deep sushi. I, I think the right way to think about this is yeah. to say that we had a, we were flying along in this airplane that everyone told us was completely safe. And suddenly, in a clear blue sky, the airplane went into this terrifying, uncontrolled dive. And through some combination of good luck and good piloting, uh, we leveled off and we seemed to be climbing again. Uh, now, one reaction is to say, see? Everything was under control all along. But I think the reaction ought to be, my God, maybe we don't know how this thing works. And maybe we've just dodged a bullet, to mix metaphors. Uh, but this is, it's not so much that this was the worst crisis we've ever had, but it was the most inexplicable crisis we've ever had. Uh, it, it tells us that the world is a much more dangerous place than we thought it was just two years ago. It's more dangerous because? Because the kinds of safeguards that we built up after the Great Depression, you know, we... We know what the Great Depression was like. We know about bank runs. And we thought we had all of those things under control. And now what we had in these last couple of years is a sort of high-tech, globalized version of the kinds of things that happened in the 1930s. Now, the world didn't end this year uh, so far. Probably we're going to have a few months of, of relatively good news. Uh, but it's showing us that the world has outgrown the protections we built. We built, you know, we built a marginal line of defenses and it looks like it's being outflanked. When you look at Japan, I want to go back to Japan, yeah. what is it you see there now happening when you have zero interest rates? Right. Japan is, I, I'd say Japan is the heart of what I think of as, as the, the, the reappearance of old troubles in a new sort of higher tech guise. Japan is an economy which suffers from an excess of virtue. The problem with the Japanese is they want to save so much that they can't persuade investors to invest all of it, yeah, right. even at a zero interest right, rate. Right. And, you know, that, that's, that's incredible. Because saving is so deep in their psyche. Well, it's partly that. It's also one thing. Some good things have happened. Uh, they've eliminated inflation. They've convinced people there will be no more inflation. That turns out to be disastrous. Because when you don't expect inflation, cash looks like a very good investment. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese are busily accumulating cash, which means that there isn't enough spending. It used to be said at the time, at the time of the Japanese economic crisis, when the Japanese were seemingly at the, the lowest ebb, it said that they had to change their entire banking system. That was number one. Yeah. You know, because the banking system, in a sense, they were loaning too much money to everybody, and therefore they're making a lot of bad loans, and they need to regulate their banking system. And if they did that, uh, with other suggestions from American uh, and other places, then they would get on the road to reform. They also, it was said at the time, had to change their philosophy of investing versus saving. America had the different problem, everybody used to say. We had too much investing and not enough saving, and that was what was wrong with the American economy. My question is, did they change the banking system, number one, and B, did it have no effect? They, they did. They've done a lot of things, uh, which are probably good in the long run. And as John Maynard Keynes, my hero, said, in the long run, we are all dead. The problem is none of these things was good for the short run. The banks are doing more responsible lending in Japan right. now. That, unfortunately, is not what they need. They need people to spend money, not, not be right. careful about how it's right. spent. Um, the other thing I think you have to say is that if there's one lesson that you learn when you look back either at the 1930s or you look at what happened these last couple of years. It's that bad things can happen to good economies. Uh, there's a lot about Japan that's still really good. The technology is still really good. The uh, business leadership, in many ways, is still pretty good. 
Um, the management methods and the business yeah, plans. Yeah, their are all ability good. to understand. You know, you look at the latest bits of of information technology from Japan, and they're actually still very much competitive with the world. Uh, what they've done is they've managed to have a monetary, a financial screw up. They had this enormous financial bubble in the late 1980s, which right. burst, catapulted them into this sort of trap they're now stuck in, where zero interest rates are not low enough. Um, to me, they don't look like some alien race that's inferior to us. To me, they look a lot like us. If you talk to the Japanese, they will say, Jap America 1999 reminds us of Japan 1989. There's a little bit of element of wishful thinking in that, right? But, uh, but is enough of a, a veracity in that to worry you? Yeah, sure. If you think that uh, the U.S. market, if you think that the Dow is unreasonable, if you think that, say, 7,000 is a more reasonable value than 11,000, yeah. which is possible, uh, you ask yourself, what would happen to the U.S. economy if, in the course of a couple of months, the, the market were to decide to agree with that assessment? Uh, we could very easily, two years from now, find ourselves in the same boat that Japan is in. The market doesn't agree with that assessment doesn't accept the Japanese wisdom that we are where they were in 89 when everything looked great and all of a sudden everything came tumbling down. The market, the stock market, doesn't accept that wisdom because, in your judgment? Well, good question. Uh, one answer is there's been some real good news. Don't want to say that, you know, America, this is, it's not a facade. There's a lot of good stuff about the American economy. We, you know, nobody thought we could grow this much without inflation. Right? But, of course, nobody thought the Japanese economy circa 1989 could do that. The other thing is, look, suppose that you were skeptical about whether the valuations were right. And you've probably been skeptical for two years. At this point, you've been sitting there, sitting on your cash while everybody else has been making money. <laughs> no, and you, in the long run, you'll be right. But in the long run, hey, you know, uh, particularly a lot of investment in this modern world is done by not by the person whose own money is at stake, but by managers who are on average about 29 years old, mm -hmm. don't remember a falling stock market, don't remember a recession. Uh, Some of them don't remember 87. That, well, no, a lot of them don't. I mean, it's really true that, that uh, they've never seen anything but a strong dollar and a strong Dow and, and, uh, and a booming economy. Okay, but that's inflation. not the reason that they don't recognize what they're, I mean, it, because if they look at it, they say, look, I mean, what they normally look at is an expectation of corporate earnings, right? No, but if, in fact, if you really do it, if you do really do the arithmetic here, uh, it's very hard, even with the corporate earnings we've got, to, and even with, with you know, projecting forward that st things stay good, it's really, really hard to come up with a set of numbers that will justify those current valuations. Uh, you have to believe, basically, that everything that can possibly go right will go right, in inverted Murphy's Law. Now, it could happen. The main point I, I want to make is that we are, we've seen, we've seen other economies go through this um, incredible optimistic boom, and then that turns sour. Uh, and we've seen that some of the, the standard ways of dealing with it haven't worked in those cases. And we ought to be trying to prepare ourselves for that eventuality instead of saying we're great, we're on top of the so world. So how do we prepare ourselves? Well, the first thing is um, I'd like to see a little bit of inflation. Uh, I think that we ought to fight this price stability. Uh, that we're a lot better. We'd be a lot better off if we had, if we make sure that the inflation numbers look like two, two and a half percent, so that the interest rates are a little bit higher when you go into the recession. Uh, what I've been saying to the Japanese uh, is that they actually need to try to convince people that there's going to be some inflation in Japan to make it. Uh, so, so that they don't hang on to their cash. A lot easier to convince people... Inflation does what to, a con to an economy? Oh, I mean, the good thing is inflation means that you have interest rates that are a bit higher. I mean, that sounds like a bad thing, but actually it means that you come into a recession with interest rates that are like 6% instead of interest rates that are like 2%, and then when the recession comes, you have 6% of interest to cut instead of 2 so you're more likely to be able to stop the recession. Mm -hmm. um, it creates a little bit of, uh, you know, people uh, makes it a little bit harder to plan. But we're not, we're not, we're talking about two, three percent inflation. It doesn't really make a do a lot of harm. Um, the other thing. Uh, so, but, but if you make this argument, yeah, that we need a little bit of inflation, you are, in a sense, going exactly against the grain of Alan Greenspan, um, whose entire tenure at the Federal Reserve has been to make sure yeah. that there was a restraint on inflation, and he's done it by the manipulation of interest rates, well, correct or not? Yeah, 
Um, he, so you're saying, you're saying the guy that's given the most credit, along with Reuben and the president, because it happened on their watch, for what has been an expansive economy and a reduction of the budget deficit has been, in your judgment, wrong? No, I think he has been, he may have carried a little bit too far. There's a big difference between getting the economy from 10% inflation down to 3 which is a very good thing, and that's, getting that's it Paul Volcker, <laughs> and getting it well, but Greenspan more or less kept, and getting it from three to zero, which is not such a good thing. And uh, you know, um, there was a guy uh, who back in '91 wrote an article saying, you know, we we should probably not squeeze all of the inflation out of the economy. We might need that. And I, was, I think his name was Larry Summers. Uh, <laughs> he wrote an article about that back in '91. So it, it's not that outlandish an idea, but sure. it's a thing that tends to you know very hard. Uh, I, I give. Greenspan credit for well, not being... Well, I wonder if Larry Summers, now Secretary of the Treasury, still believes that and still says that. Um, I'm sure he doesn't say it because he's learned that... Uh, he's what learned he from Greenspan that whatever you say, make sure it isn't clear. Yeah, uh, and, and it causes tremors on Wall Street. That's right. But, I, no, I, I mean, I give us some credit. I give the Fed some credit for, in fact, not going into the temptation to drive the numbers on inflation all the way to zero. The point here is what ought to be done. I mean, that's what I want to get right. at. And you're saying, one, a little more inflation. I just want to point out that a lot of people would differ with you on that point. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's right. Including the chairman of the Federal Reserve. Well, it's not clear what he in his inmost uh, self believes, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't agree with me out, flat out, sure. Okay, because you're saying, well, maybe he, he would like to see, wouldn't mind seeing a little bit, but he worries if you see a little bit, you get a lot more, and that, therefore, that's the danger. I right? mean, look, the, the Bank of England, who I happen to think is, you know, they're, they're also smart guys. They, their inflation target is 2.5. And our target is? We don't have a formal target. What do they're, you think it is? Uh, I think ours is a sort of 2. Yeah. But theirs is 2.5, not less than 2.5, but 2.5. If the inflation rate there drops to 1.5, they try to push it up. Okay, a little bit of inflation would be good for us. What else would be good for us? Uh, We've got to at least say that we're willing in emergencies to uh, step on the flow of international capital. Uh, what, what's happened now is that people have come to believe that no matter what's happening, you can always uh, move your money, even if it's a panic situation. So how do we step, how do we accelerate the flow of international capital? We don't accelerate it. We, we, we oh, slow oh, you mean we restrain break it. it. Restrain yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, the, um, it turns out, if you look at the success stories uh, in, in, in what's happened lately, um, which is be? South Korea has turned things around. Yeah. Brazil did a lot right, better than we right, thought it would. Right. In both cases, what was crucial was they did what everybody said, oh, you mustn't do, which was they set, got the bankers in a room and said, look, um, if you try to pull your money out, all hell's going to break loose. So I want an agreement not to pull the money out. Okay, now, uh, they, now they managed to make it you know, voluntary in the sense of you, you, and you. You volunteer. But, uh, you know, it was... Uh, now, the trouble is that the world is getting more complicated, and it's not just the banks. In these cases, if you've got the banks in the room, that was enough. But, you know, you start to worry about the hedge funds and so on. We're going to have to at least make it clear that that can happen, which in itself is probably enough to, uh, to sort of make the hot money a little cooler. That gives us some, some, some room. What else would you do? Uh, we got to think... Inflation, restrained capital flow. That's right. The, the third thing is we got to start thinking, and this is hard, we have to, uh, we have to f figure out who else in the economy is, for all practical purposes, a bank. And we have to extend the same kinds of controls, regulations, and also support that we have for banks. Bank, what kind of bank do you mean? You mean like a commercial bank, like an investment bank, or either of those? What I mean by a bank is anybody who basically takes, uh, promises to pay people short term, but invests in longer term stuff. Uh, and the reason that's important is when one of those gets in trouble, then the, then the financial system freezes. Uh, you know, for two weeks, uh, two or three weeks last fall, uh, when LTCM went down, uh, the U.S. financial markets, the whole funding of uh, real estate investment, just came to a dead halt. There was nothing happening. And it was because, it, although no one had really noticed it, all of that was dependent on things like LTCM to keep the wheels turning. Now who, who deserves credit for saving oh, LTCM? Uh, 
What, was it the investment banks that had an investment in LTC? In well, it? no. I mean, they, they were, that was, again, they volunteered to rescue it okay. at, at, because they were told to volunteer. Uh, By? Uh, most important, Bill McDonough at the New York Fed, right. who got them in a room. Uh, and Said to, to them? And said to them, We can't let LTCM go down. That's right. And because it's already a freeze in terms of, say, the real estate. Investment. Well, it has just starting to happen there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, at that point, people at the Fed, I was talking with one of them, and he, they, they, I was saying, what, what do we do now? And he said, pray. But what they actually did was they, they got LTCM's uh, investors in a room and got them to cough off money. And they got, uh, you know, and Alan Greenspan stood behind him. And Bob Rubin looked confident on the steps of the Treasury. And it was great. I mean, it was a fantastic thing. This was, the army was about to break in, in, yeah. in route. And the general rode up on his white horse and waved his sword around and shouted something, and he rallied them. And that's great, but, you know, a financial system that depends on heroes to save it. Yeah. It's one that someday is not going to find the hero. Oh, a couple locker room kind of questions. Yeah. Number one, uh, I have, notwithstanding this book, The Return of Depression Economics, and our analogy to Japan, right? right? Number two, the things you've just suggested in terms of what make, would make you feel better. How good do you feel about the American economy? And how good are the good times going to last? I'm very nervous. Um, it, we've got all the classic indicators of, of a bubble, right? We got all the, if, if you're looking for all the things that are true, have been true just about when Things went pop in in previous you know everything from from uh, Japan '89 back to Britain in the early '80s back to, you know you can go back through a whole sequence of them you'll find that uh, actually there's some guy there's a, a, a bank economist named Stephen King it's a great name for this who, yeah. who's done a sort of you know checklist of what, how do you know you're in a you know you're in a bubble when and and we sort of fit eight of the ten criteria right now so we we are on all the ten criteria we match yeah well eight of ten you okay know, I, but yeah but it's it's uh, this, there's a lot of good news, but the the financial markets are better than the good news. You know, it's sort of uh, we weren't as bad in as other that. Words, no matter, notwithstanding the good news, we shouldn't be doing this well. That's right. All right, but here's the problem: it's cry wolf time. You and others have been saying this, and the right. economy continues to grow. We're at four percent annual growth rate, aren't we? That's right. Uh, stock market is crashing through 1,100, right? That's right. It's. Uh, the trouble is, uh, eleven thousand. Eventually, the wolf does come. Yeah, I know, but I mean, so, but but I mean, it, if it's going to come in nineteen two thousand four, then I got. I, I don't. I don't. I got a lot of good times to invest That's in. That's right. No, I, you know, I could be wrong. Uh, well, you'll eventually be right because eventually economies do That's go right. through cycles. Yeah, I. But I mean, don't you have the feeling there's a kind of manic feeling right now? I mean, just well, it's not any different than I, mean, I can remember two years ago walking down the street with people saying, I'm getting all of my, except in my own company, I'm pulling all of my investments out of the stock market. I said, why is it? Because it cannot last. Yeah, I think the difference for me, and sure, I mean, I don't, I, I don't claim to be a market forecaster. And you ask me, is it, uh, is, it uh, is the market crashing while we're here in the studio? Right, exactly. or, or is it going to wait another 18 months? Right. But uh, the difference for me is that if you'd asked me two years ago, I'd say, well, if it crashes, it's nothing Greenspan can't handle. We know how to deal with these things. It'll, paper losses, the real economy will be fine. Right. What I now know from Japan, what I now know from Asia is that's not anything like a guarantee. Uh, and if we don't start to put some scotch tape on these rips right away, uh, it may be a lot worse than you think when the crash comes. So what you're saying, the return of depression economics, and in addition what you're saying here is that we ought to be looking very carefully at the experience of the Japanese. That's right. The Japanese, the South Koreans, even the Indonesians, because they're not that different from us. They're more like us than not. And, you know, Americans have this thing. Americans, we sometimes get afraid of the rest of the world. We don't learn from the rest of the world. Uh, when you try to talk to American businessmen about what happened in, in Britain or in Germany or, or even in Canada, they just don't think it has anything to do with them. As long as the guys aren't immediately competitors uh, to us, then, they, then the rest of the world, you know, we change the channel. The rest of the world really doesn't exist to us. Uh, but, and, and the Japanese in particular seem so different from us that we tend to sort of uh, think of them either as, as invincible demons or as, uh, you know, complete losers. Uh, the reality is that 
they're a lot like us. And if a lot like we are, us in the way their economy works, in the way sure. their... Sure. Japan, uh, my feeling about Japan is it's as if, oh, I mean, it, Japan, it, it's, it's like a, a civil, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an advanced, sophisticated, well-educated, democratic, stable country. No, they've got their problems, but, and here they are stuck in something which is kind of like a slow-motion version of the 1930s. Uh, now, that's as if uh, a modern city was suddenly invaded by nomads from the steppes. You know, that's not supposed to happen in the modern world. And it, it, it seems to me that that ought to shake us up quite a lot. We shouldn't say, oh, well, it's just the Japanese. We should say, gee, you know, how much do we have in common with them? And the more you look at it, the more you start to realize that, uh, except for immigration, which is a really big thing we have in our favor, we have a lot in common with them. Uh, we could... Uh, if we're not careful, find ourselves in, in something like the same kind of, of trap they're now in. Hmm. If there should be a great debate about our economic future in the 19, in the year 2000 political campaign, what ought it be? Uh, it ought to be about, uh, it really ought to be about what have we done to make this economy safer. Uh, I'm afraid it's going to be how are we going to uh, how, how are we going to use this surplus to hand out goodies to the population? That's what it's, it's probably going to be about. And it's but, going to be Medicare, it's going to be prescription medicine, it's going to be whatever. Yeah, and what it really should be is about who is more equipped to uh, modernize, post-modernize our institutions so that, so that we don't turn into another Japan. Uh, I mean, I have very little hope that it might be that that's the way it's going to turn out, but it, th that's, that's what ought to be on the agenda. Is there any part of you that thinks all of the effort to reduce the budget deficit was a bad idea? No, because I think uh, that's another thing that we probably have going for us is the ability, you know, because we start from a surplus, uh, it means that we can, uh, we can do an FDR if we need to. This, uh, John Maynard Keynes. Yeah. You're, what? I mean, how would you describe his ideas for you? Oh, I think it's, you know, he is the, the great economist of the 20th century because he not only showed us how to understand depressions, but, but showed us a way out. The way he showed us out was to spend his way out, wasn't it? It was more sophisticated than that. It was first print <laughs> oh, money right. and oh. then spend in <laughs> well, emergencies. But, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit better than that. And, yeah, well, what was it then? Well, it, it was, you know, first, that you, you, you push money into circulation. Right. And secondly, that you do pump prime the economy by, with, with spending. Right. Uh, and the point is it worked. You know, it, it, it puts uh, people to work and it gives people and you encourage them to buy things and therefore people make more things and therefore they buy more things. That's right. You is that to, it? Well, you, you, you have simplify. to remember just how, how hard it was. You know, lots of ideas, you know, theory of evolution yeah. sounds pretty simple once it's been explained. I know. You know? I no, I but that's exactly what the, you're saying the Japanese need to do. The Japanese need to do it on a way, yeah, I mean, there's, there's more to it again than that, but yes, that's what they need to do. Uh, right. And they have, what can I say? They, the big problem I think we've had is that we, in the 70s and the 80s, we had the problem of governments doing that sort of thing too much. And so we learned very, we learned the hard lesson that you can't always be printing money. You can't, that inflation doesn't solve all your problems. Uh, now we're fighting the last war. We're, we're sitting there and saying, well, you know, that means that printing money is always a bad idea. That means that austerity is the answer to all problems. Uh, pain is good for you. Uh, and, and the trouble is that uh, times have changed, and now deflation is a bigger threat than inflation. Uh, if we continue to fight the last war, then we make ourselves a lot more vulnerable to uh, depression economics. The return of depression economics, Paul Krugman, professor of economics at MIT. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Stay with us.